Our last talk will be John Herbert, also theoretical uh, analysis of excitons from the Ohio State University. Thanks to um, Suggy and to Chris for the for the invitation and and yeah, as Chris said, I'm I'm going to talk about um, so this, this is also a, a strictly computational talk, and I'm going to talk about the the role of um, charge transfer states in the low lying um, optical spectrum of, of pentacene and trying to use um, quantum chemistry, uh, both both some standard models, but but also some new ones that, that we built in in my lab um, to, to do sort of a bottom up approach to the to the modeling of the excited states in in crystal and pentacene. So the um, motivation here is is singlet fission, um, which Pretty, pretty well known these days, but but for those who don't know, single fission describes the the spin allowed transition of a of a singlet excited state in in certain OPV materials, and, and pentacene and tetracene are, are sort of the the canonical examples. Um, the spin allowed um, splitting of the excitation energy into into excitation energy that's shared by triplet states of um, of two neighboring molecules that are overall um, spin coupled to a singlet. And, and so that makes this uh, spin allowed process and means that it goes fast with, with, um, with near unit quantum efficiency. And the particular question that I'm going to drill down on today is, um, is what, if any, is the role of, of charge transfer states in, in this fission step? And so there's been a lot of debate in the literature about what the mechanism is to, to go from this, this locally excited S1 state to this um, triplet pair state, and, and whether that mechanism is direct or, or whether it, it couples to charge transfer states, and, and if so, what are the energetics of, of those charge transfer states? And so that's, that's what I want to get at. Um, there's been a lot of previous theoretical attempts, um, including a couple of papers by Sahar when she was a postdoc with Jeff Neaton, um, various others, and um, uh, reaching different conclusions about whether there are charge transfer states or, or whether the low-lying um, excited states of, of various pentacene models have significant charge transfer character. And the um, the general conclusion of small cluster quantum chemistry studies has been no, but, and, and that's not universally true, there are some exceptions, um, uh, but, but, but on average, no. And, and whereas the general conclusion of, of periodic uh, GW type calculations has been yes. And, and so um, our goal in this, in, in this project that I'm gonna to describe today was, was to try to just connect those two limits and, and in particular to, to build up um, a bottom-up model that we can attack with, with good quantum chemistry, but, um, but, but ask how large does that model need to be in, in order for us to, um, to, to make a plausible case that, that, we're, um, that we're doing something relevant to, to the bulk material, to crystal and pentacene or, or thin films of pentacene. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so so we're going to attack this in in two different ways um, in 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 this talk, and and the first of those is going to be using an ab initio version of a Frankel Davidov exciton model that that my group has been developing for about five years now. So I want to describe that in a couple of slides. So first of all. Um, this is an exciton model in, in the sense that goes all the way back to, to Frankel's work on um, collective excitations of anthracene in the 1930s, uh, meaning that we take an ansatz for the, um, for the collective excitations um, that's in a locally excited basis or in, in, a, in a monomer basis. And, and so um, we just, and, and so we're going to compute um, direct products of of monomer basis states where where one of the monomers is excited and we can do that in a in a distributed fashion and, and so it's efficient to scale up to, to large numbers of monomers um, and then we're going to throw those states as a basis into Schrodinger's equation and allow Schrodinger's equation to tell us what the what the CI coefficients should be and then that so that's just a totally standard exciton model um, but what sort of the twist in, in our work is that it is a first principles exciton model in the sense that we don't try to make any sort of cheesy dipole coupling approximations for the matrix elements um, that, 
that might be justifiable if your chromophores are well separated, um, but are probably not justifiable at crystal packing distances. And, and so we, we compute direct product basis states, um, and, but then we compute the, the actual Hamiltonian matrix elements between them. Um, and then the last part about this that's, that's important for the, for the singlet fission problem is that this correlated triplet pair state um, is actually very easy to describe in a site basis because it simply looks like um, single excitations to form the triplet on each of two monomers. And then you work out the totally trivial Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to, to spin couple those to a, to a singlet. Um, so that's very easy. Um, whereas from the standpoint of supramolecular quantum chemistry approaches, the, the correlated triplet pair state or the multi-exciton state is, is, is quite challenging to describe because it's a true double excitation. And so you really need highly correlated wave functions um, in order to capture that state. And that I think has been part of the difficulty and, and certainly a significant part of the limitation that has kept the quantum chemistry studies um, limited mostly, but not exclusively to dimers. Okay, so, so we've been working on this model for a few years. We can scale it up to, to quite large numbers of monomers. And so we've looked at things like energy transfer dynamics in this um, naphthalene diimid um, organic nanotube that a colleague of mine synthesized and a different colleague um, did a structural characterization with solid state NMR a few years ago. Um, uh, more recently, we have analytic uh, derivative couplings for, for, for this exciton model. And so if we, if we use the exciton model to get the, the site energies and the energy transfer couplings for something like a holstein pierlis um, Hamiltonian, then the exciton phonon coupling parameters just look like derivatives of the matrix elements with respect to um, to the vibrations with respect to the phonon modes, and, and we can calculate those um, with analytic gradient theory, and we've done that in a proof of concept paper for tetracine that, that I don't have time to talk about. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, um, this ab initio exciton model simply furnishes a very convenient diabatic basis for, for thinking about the various states that um, that may be involved in the singlet fission process in, in pentacene. So we're, so we're gonna take pentacene as our, as our canonical example of a singlet fission material. And for the example of this slide, I'm gonna consider a dimer. And so we can, we can very easily compute um, locally excited states and then linear combinations of those locally excited basis states will give us Frankel excitons. Um, but we can also use ionized monomers in our basis. And so that gives us a basis of diabatic states that can describe charge transfer. And then I've, I've talked about the multi-exciton state and, and this can then be generalized to a, to a arbitrary number of, of monomers. So I'm gonna show you um, up through hexamer later on, but, but just for the, for, the, uh, for the dimer example, um, you take these, um, take these five diabetic states plus the ground state that I've just described and you throw them into Schrodinger's equation and, and you let Schrodinger's equation tell you what the, what the coefficients should be. Um, but then you can easily uh, read off from the diabetic basis whether there is significant charge transfer in these adiabatic eigenstates. So, so unlike uh, more standard quantum chemistry approaches where you compute Born-Oppenheimer wave functions uh, and then you, you sort of have to dig in and, and try to decide if that wave function um, has charge transfer character or not. We have diabats that look like charge transfer. And, and so we can read off from the coefficients whether they have charge transfer character or not. Now, now everything mixes. And, and so in general, um, things are a mixture of, of Frankel excitons and, and charge transfer and whatnot, but, but we can apportion that very easily just by looking at the, at the eigenvectors. Okay, so, so let's do that um, for three different cluster models of, of pentacene and, and then also a dimer in, in the next graph. So, so on the left here are, are two different tetramers taken out of the crystal structure and then here's a hexamer. Um, and I've computed a spectrum of, of, of a bunch of states and then we simply read off um, what are the states whose largest 
um, CI coefficient corresponds to a charge transfer diabat, and those are the ones that are shown in blue. And so what you see emerging from this is that the, the low energy part of the spectrum is actually dominated by states that are at least mixing in a significant amount of a charge transfer diabetic state. And then putting that whole spectrum together and, and, and not breaking it down by states, but, but then also showing you the dimer, what emerges from this is, is that the dimer is really something of an outlier. So um, the states are much higher in, in energy. Um, and, and in particular, you, you need to go to much higher in energy in order to get um, something that, that looks like charge transfer. Um, but, but we see already in the, in the tetramer models, so the, in the gold and the purple are two different tetramers, and then the green is a hexamer. So already to a certain extent in the tetramers and, and more so in the hexamer, you're seeing the emergence of a semi-continuum of, of states already in a, in a fairly tractable quantum chemistry model. And so we think that, that we need to go to, to larger than dimers for sure to, to have a realistic model of the material, but, but maybe not that much larger. Okay, and then the last part of this talk, um, we're also going to attack this problem using some, some more standard methods. Um, so time-dependent density functional theory calculations. Um, the technology by now is, is pretty well known. Um, so we, we use a we use range separated hybrid functionals and we use this technique pioneered by by Roy Baer and Lear Kronick um, called optimal tuning where where we bas basically adjust the range separation parameter um, to match the ionization energy theorem for the frontier energy levels both of of our of our cluster of molecules so so this this condition is 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 setting the the HOMO energy level of our cluster of molecules, but then we also apply that condition to the to the anion. And so effectively, we're, we're setting the frontier orbital energy levels, HOMO and LUMO, in a in a physically motivated, one can argue, non non empirical way. Um, and now I'm going to show you um, TDDFT results from a bunch of different functionals. So I'm showing you the the blank graph here just to prepare you for, for what's coming. Um, so looking at my, my four different cluster models, um, dimer, two different, two different tetramers, and, and then a hexamer. Um, and, and so then when I bring in all of the data, which I'm only going to show you for, for a moment, a um, you know, bunch of different functionals, but then let's, let's break it down and um, and, and, and so these, these three functionals that are named here in the, in the upper left, I'm going to refer to these as, as sort of off the shelf functionals. So B3OIP sort of sets a baseline for, for everything that we do in, in time dependent density functional theory, and then two different um, range separated hybrid functionals that, that work pretty well. In, in a lot of different contexts. And, and what you see here is, is that there's, there's really considerable variation in, in the energetics of these, of these low-lying states, sort of an uncomfortable amount of variation in the energetics of we're plotting the, the first 10 excited states for all of these clusters, not telling you at this point anything about what the, what the nature or the character of those states are, but, um, but just looking at their energies. Um, but on the other hand, when we switch to these optimally tuned range separated hybrids, I, I would argue that it removes the worst part of the functional to functional variation in, in these numbers. Um, doesn't entirely remove it, um, but, but these are much more robust against the, the choice of the underlying GGA or, or hybrid functional that you use. And so all of these approaches that are labeled OT, RSH, and various other stuff, um, have a couple of things going for them. First of all, um, they are asymptotically correct for describing the Coulomb interaction between a separated electron and hole, um, unlike something like B3LYP, which is not. Um, and secondly, um, they have set the HOMO and the LUMO energy levels of these clusters in this non-empirical way based on the ionization energy and the electron affinity of the material. Okay. And then the last thing that I wanna do is to sort of so you know in, in these data, I don't tell you anything about what the what the nature of these states are. I've just plotted the lowest ten states for for each of these systems with with each of these functionals. 
Um, so I want to dig down into um, to, to see what is the nature of these states. So, um, and, and so I'm going to use um, various decomposition, actually just one decomposition of the transition density here. So Sahar um, in her talk has discussed very briefly the idea of looking at these electron hole correlations in real space. And so this is an equation that comes from one of her papers um, that I'm not going to talk about, but I added it in her talk just to, to give her a citation. Um, so, because I think that's a, a very nice way to look at things. But um, if you are using atom centered basis functions, there's an even easier way, which is that you can integrate the, the square of this transition density over, over basis functions. And you can use the fact that your basis functions are, are tagged to atoms and your atoms are tagged to monomers to basically decompose this transition density um, into particle and whole parts on each of your monomers. And so, there's four plots down here. Three of them are for a dimer. So they look like these two by two uh, matrices of, of charge transfer numbers. And given, given a plot that looks like this, you can read off um, something that looks like a, a locally excited state on monomer two versus a, a Frankel exciton state that's a linear combination of locally excited states on both monomers um, versus something that, that's asymmetric with off diagonal character indicating charge transfer. And then in, in small finite clusters, you, you often also get these charge resonance states that look like symmetric linear combinations of forward and backward charge transfer. But that is also very easy to identify in this, in this hexamer in this case. And so we go and look at those for um, pentacene, one, one of my pentacene tetramer isomers um, using two of the off the shelf functionals versus two of the tuned functionals, you see that the behavior um, is really quite different that um, in these off the shelf functionals, the, the charge transfer states are, are pushed up to, to, to rather high energies. And so all of the low lying states, and I'm showing you just the first four excited states in this calculation um, are, are basically Frankel excitons. Um, versus these, these tuned functionals, you're, you're seeing charge separation or, or charge resonance states arising already in the, in the very lowest states in the optical spectrum of this tetramer. Um, and the same is true or, or even, even more so in the, in the hexamer where, where now you see, um, you see the stabilization of, of uh, asymmetric charge transfer even, even in the lowest excited state of this hexamer using, using these tuned range separated hybrid functionals. And so um, with that, I'll summarize and, and try to wrap up on time. Um, so approaching these, these cluster models of, of, of pentacene in, in two different ways. First of all, with our ab initio exciton model, um, I, I think that we make a pretty compelling case if, if anyone really needed convincing that that dimer models are, are not good models of, of this material, that, that, that really the dimer stands out as being an outlier among larger clusters um, in, in that the, the states are, are well spaced and the charge separated states are, are really at rather large energies. Um, but you may not have to go that much larger than a dimer in, in order to see a semi continuum of states growing in and, and in order to see um, states with genuine charge separation character being uh, showing up in the, in the low energy part of the optical spectrum. And then um, I would say that, that the same conclusions um, basically come out of our TDDFT calculations. And I, I had to abbreviate the second part of this um, considerably, but we've done a lot more work with this in a paper that just came out. Um, and, and so that paper is cited here and, and I'll just um, thank the, one current student and one former student who, who have worked on this um, and let's see, funded by the DOE and, and all of the methods that I've described, including the ab initio exciton model are, are available in the, in the current release of the QCAM code. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions. All right, very nice talk. And we've got a, a lineup of questions. Uh, first, uh, is the environment's dielectric response and electrostatic embedding taken into account somehow in the calculation? In in most of what I in most of what I showed you, the answer is no. Um, although we did do some tests with um, 
the hexamer model where we throw in a, a dielectric continuum boundary is basically with the optical dielectric of the material. Um, and for the hexamer, um, we get almost no change. And I, e even for states that, that mm -hmm. um, have significant charge transfer character, and, and I take that as some indication that that, that hexamer may actually be close to being converged. Okay. Okay, that was a question from Gabriele Davino uh, from Danny Cotton. Uh, how sensitive is the, the charge transfer mixing into the Frankel manifold? How sensitive is that to the coupling elements? Uh, well, <laughs> there's no coupling, there's no mixing. Um, so it's, okay. certainly, it's certainly sensitive. I, I don't exactly know how to quantify that. Um, Okay, so those are just not tunable parameters. Those are coming just yeah, right from the, well, the, so, the, so the calculation right. I mean, itself. So the philosophy that, that we've taken here is, you know, let, let's let Schrodinger decide what the mixing should be. So, so we, um, so you know, in my in my exciton model, um, the 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 approximation that we're making, the model that we're building, is the exciton ansatz, where we assume that the collective excitation for the for the crystal or for the cluster can be written as a linear combination of whatever diabatic states that we decide to use. And, and that's where the decision making comes in is what what diabatic states are, are you going to use because then then we compute exact matrix elements of the full Hamiltonian. And, and so you know it, it is possible that we have left out important states. Um, we don't include other than the triplet pair state, we don't include anything that looks like a double excitation. Um, although the S2 state in pentacene is at least one EV higher than, than S1. And so that doesn't feel like a bad approximation in this particular case. Um, but, you know, so, so that's a limitation is, you, you know, you may leave something out, but, but then we, we, we throw all of that into Schrodinger's equation and, and we allow Schrodinger's equation to decide um, how to turn those couplings into, into mixing coefficients. Thanks. That should be the, that should be the best in principle. <laughs> Um, Sagi has a question that's, I think, related to the, the one of the previous questions, which is, what about the effect of solvents or environment on the charge transfer states? You know, as I'm sure you know, there's there's a lot of people, you know, because people assume that CT state is an intermediate, they say, oh, I can tune the rate all over the place by tuning the energetics of that charge transfer state by the dielectric environment. Um, yeah. So, you know, can you comment uh, on that approach? Um, so. Uh... On that experimental approach, no, I can comment on what we're doing. So, so I, I think it's 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 the right question to ask, or maybe I just say that because it's the question that we we are asking. Um, but so so I think it's a good question. So so we we've, we've made only we've done only one preliminary step in that in that direction. So as some of you may know, one of the other hats that I wear is is that I. We, we do a lot of work on continuum salvation models in, in my group. And so it was very natural, at least to try. What, what happens if we put dielectric continuum boundary conditions around our, our largest model, um, say just with an optical dielectric constant of, of something like two? And, and the answer is that for hexamer, it changes the energetics basically not at all, not, not anything worth even commenting on. I, I, I had the data in this talk and I took it out. Um, but um, but, uh, let's see, what, what else did I want to say about that? Um, but, but, well, okay, but, but, but it is something that, that, that we're following up on. I, actually, I have a, um, collaboration with, with Paul Zimmerman's group to, to take some of the, the strongly correlated wave function methods that, that he's developing and, and try to put those in, in continuum solvent, which turns out to be slightly non, slightly non-trivial. Um, and so it's, it, I have no results to show you, but, um, but it's, a, it, it, it's certainly a thing that we're thinking about. But mm -hmm. for this particular material, it really feels like by going to a, to a hexamer that, that we have largely um, converged things. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I, I have questions as well, but I think I'm gonna skip over them to get to other people's. One question is, do you think the optimally tuned functionals are transferable across different molecules? I'm, I'm going to guess the answer is yes, but I'll let you um, so if, finalize if that. We do the tuning. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh -huh. so uh, okay. One, um, and, and so there was a, a very brief note that maybe I should have um, 
stopped to, to make a comment that, that says that, that we do this optimal tuning procedure for the super system and, and so not for pentacene monomer. And so we are actually okay. using different range separation parameter for the dimer than we are for the tetramer than we are for the for the hexamer. And we we did that for for a variety of reasons, but but really that was the change that kind of locked in um, the spectrum at the optimally tuned RSH level. So 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 that um, that took away a lot of the functional to functional variations in a way um, that that we didn't observe if we just did sort of the more standard approach of of let's let's tune for the homo and energy homo and lumo energy levels of the pentacene monomer and then drop that into various mm -hmm. clusters and and so. Uh, on the one hand, I, I think that's okay, or we wouldn't have done it. Um, but but you know, the full disclosure is that 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 means that there is a system size dependence to the to the functional that that we use, and um, and that means um, this this method is inherently not size extensive, and and so you you need to you know, and, and that will mean something to the to the quantum chemists at least, and 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 you know, your your ears will perk up and you, you'll immediately say that, okay, so there are certain things that, that I know that I'm not going to be able to use this approach to do. Um, and that, uh, you know, if, if I had a great workaround that didn't require me to do that, I, I would have done it already. So it's, 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 it's an irritant, but I don't quite know what to do about it at, at this point. Because you can't have everything. So I'm going to skip over, uh, even though we're at 10 o'clock, uh, David Reichman has uh, in the comments, and I'll also read them, uh, two questions and a comment. Uh, this is, you can also find this in the chat. <clears throat> the first question is, what about inversions? Well, what about symmetry in general, right? Periodic systems have inversion symmetry. The clusters that you're looking at don't. You know, does that have any fundamental, uh, lead to any fundamental change, say, in, in the properties of the, the wave functions or electron hole densities? Right. So, so, um, so, so, uh, we worried about that a lot, and I think the the short answer is that um, I, I think that our energetics are are okay for charge transfer states, um, despite these sort of symmetry artifacts or, or sometimes lack of symmetry artifacts in, in, in these finite clusters. Um, one, one thing that definitely comes out of this that, that we are not the first to point out, but we, we analyzed extensively in, in some paper that's cited in here is, is, is that you really can't trust um, dipole moments. So there are papers in the literature that, that, that want to look at dipole moments from TDDFT calculations on finite clusters. And I, I think uh, most most people are probably bothered by by that who who work on crystalline materials and and you should be bothered by it but um but but if, if you're not you know using dipole moment as a stand-in for charge separation if you're actually going and looking at the wave function and looking at you know where's the electron and where's the hole um then 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 i, I think that we're okay so i, I think okay I think that addresses what he was trying to, to get at. Okay, well, he, he can follow up. The, another question is, what's the lack of, or what's the role of screening by, and that by that he means internal screening, not the external dielectric, but internal screening between molecules in terms of just uh, changing the energies of the charge transfer states. You know, can you give at least qualitative guidance on that? Uh, I think, um, it is the difference in an excitation spectrum that in the dimer goes rapidly from 1.5 EV to 2 point something EV here, um, you know, regardless of, of or, or, or higher with different functionals um, versus in the hexamer, right here, here you have basically no none of that internal screening, right? It's, it's the literally minimalist um, example that could give you something that looks like a Frankel exciton or a charge transfer um, versus here, you, you see a full 10 states that, that don't, and, and, and probably more if we, if we took this out to, to additional numbers of states that, that don't get above, much above 
say 1.6 electron volts. And, and so, um, and, and so that, that um, what the person called in, internal screening, I, I, I think is a, is, is a different way of, of saying what, what I'm saying that, that this, this is not a good model of the material. Uh, we, we think that even these tetramers and, and, and this hexamer, cer certainly this hexamer we think is, is, is getting pretty close. Um, although maybe not fully, there, there, there are some indications that the, uh, from periodic calculations, or I think David Casanova has done um, non-periodic calculations, but in, in, in more than six monomers that, that suggest that the initially formed um, exciton might be something, I, I, I think maybe David was, was on this Zoom, but but I and so I may be misremembering his paper, but I but I thought seven or eight was was his number for the size of some of the initially formed excitons. So so it's it's possible that we're not absolutely completely converged if in the hexamer, but we think that we're getting pretty close. Okay, and then I I you know David has a third point, which is he's which is a comment, but I think I might take his comment and turn it into a question. You know, you know the, the original papers that he wrote with uh, Burkle back on the, you know, sort of saying, oh, the, the charge transfer state is there, but it lies above the, you know, it typically lies above the, the neutral state. So it, it participates through a super exchange mechanism, right? That in the dimer. In the dimer, okay, in the dimer, yeah. And then but in the it, crystal, we say it directly mixes with the okay. S1 state because it's low, just as in John's talk. Okay. So so uh, so now yeah probably we can we can probably do like uh, just just maybe a free for all but my my question was how, yeah how does your picture fit in with the super exchange idea and the and the you know because experimentally a lot of people have done the experiment where they embed efficient efficient system in a different solvents and in most cases they don't see a huge difference between uh, say between dielectric environments. And so, and so the explanation for that would be, oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, these dimers are, are in the super exchange limit and maybe you wouldn't expect that big, that big dependence. Again, I may be mangling your theory, David. So I, I'm, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to jump in and, and, and clarify that, but, but John, you're going from sort of sort of first principles ab initio, H how do those two pictures intersect? Um, so I, I, I think that, that, um, we're more or less consistent with what David just said, right? But there, I mean, we, there certainly is a, a, um, a, a charge transfer state at, at higher energy in the mm -hmm. dimer. I, I have to admit that we've, um, to some extent, not not really drilled down on on the dimer as, as much in some of these other systems because it saw uh, that we, we don't think that this is a realistic model of the. Of the crystal, and that's what we were really trying to do. So we immediately moved on to these to these larger systems. But but um, so I, I think that the picture is consistent. Now, with regard to to these experiments, um, which, which I probably should know better than I do. Um, but so so these are um, these are say single fission between covalently linked um, dimers in, yeah. in in what kinds of solvents. Just organic solvents like you know, say chloroform to hexane or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, long ago we did experiments on tetracine dimers and didn't see, you know, but those were very weakly coupled. But we didn't see any solvent dependence. And and there's there's more work where at best they see a small solvent dependence. Is my recollection. I, I don't know that works super well, but you know, there's a ton of it out there now. So okay, so so the other thing is that the the, the charge transfer state. I, I actually, you know. David's point about the, the differences between the dimer and, and the crystal is, is maybe maybe the key thing that that the 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 positioning of the charge transfer states in the spectrum is 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 really system dependent. So even in these even in these cluster models, you know, it's it's dependent on the size of our cluster model. Um, it's it's actually we we tried these two different tetramers um, because the energetics are are actually um, reasonably distinct in this sort of extended linear tetramer versus this more compact one. And, and we originally did this because some of the some of the quantum chemistry studies that are out there in the literature don't even bother to tell you what clusters they're looking at. They say, oh, well, we did this on a tetramer. 
Um, and, and it really, if you know, when you're modeling it with these, with these small finite systems, it really matters a lot what tetramer you used. And, and so I think if I could speculate a little bit about generalizing that, that conclusion, I think that the, the energetics of the charge transfer states may be exquisitely system dependent. And, and so, you know, in those covalently linked systems, um, you know, it could be a very different picture than, than what, than what mm -hmm. one has in say pentacene thin films. And, you know, in principle, we could try to model that in these covalently linked mm -hmm. systems, but we haven't done that. I'd say your conclusions are actually pretty consistent with the, the covalent dimer experiments that I'm aware of. Um, let, me, let me ask one more question from the chat, and then I think we'll be done with the official part. We're already sort of done with the official part. Uh, can you comment on anisotropic dielectric embedding? Do you, do you always use isotropic embedding, uh, or do you use something else? Who's asking that? <laughs> that, that is John Bender. OK. Um, <laughs> that's a secret project in my group is the anisotropic dielectric embedding. <laughs> um, so on, 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 so actually the, the, uh, we're, we're, we're using it for, for a totally unrelated project, which is to look at, at photo electron spectroscopy at the air water interface. But, um, but here, so, so the, the continuum embedding that, that we've done in the context of these pentacene um, systems is, is, is really just the, the baby step to, to ask, well, okay, so we've got these continuum models around and, and, and we have the expertise to use them. So, so what happens if we put um, dielect, op, optical dielectric around this hexamer just, just to, to ask, is it, is it going to be some huge change where, where we immediately then know that we're nowhere near the convergence limit or, or is it small? And, and in fact, it's vanishingly small, but I, but I can't, uh, I don't claim that we've done this thoroughly at, 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 at all. Um, so uh, we have the technology sort of to do anisotropic dielectric embedding, but we haven't done it on the system. We, we have the technology, meaning we have a pilot code, but it's slow. OK. OK, with that, I think maybe maybe we'll stop here, pause. I don't know, Sagi, do you want to? No, um, open up yeah, I just want to thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone.